Uh, great. So this is uh, conversation number five. Uh, we don't have Joe with us um, today, but uh, we've got uh, Dan and, and Liz um, back, and we're delighted to um, welcome uh, Professor Brett Smith from uh, all the way from Durham. And uh, Brett, it's uh, it's fantastic to have you all, uh, with us today. I'm, I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing about your work uh, and the, the way that you've. Um, co-production and the, the needs of um, or people's um, what matters most to people at the heart of, uh, of, what, of what you've done. Um, so uh, for the formalities I'm uh, Rob Copeland I'm director of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre here in, uh, in Sheffield. Liz do you mind just introducing yourself? Liz Fletcher uh, currently work in Sheffield Health and Social Care and uh, soon to be working in Essex um, for Sport for Confidence. Uh, Dan? Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan Austin Home. Uh, I'm Director for Centre of Quality Improvement Clinical Audit in the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Um, uh, here, reflecting on my work with the NIHR clerks over the last 10 15 years. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and then, uh, Brett, just to uh, ask you to introduce yourself and then sort of perhaps start us off with kind of what does co production uh, mean to you? I'll start with the easy one and myself. Uh, uh, Brett Smith, uh, I'm a professor in disability and physical activity in the Department of Sport and Exercise Sciences at Durham University. I'm also the uh, director of research there. Well, I mean, you've asked me what does co-production mean? Uh, well, we could be here for the next uh, hour, of course. Uh, we could jump into the traditional definitions like the NIHR and everything else, but let me take it from a more personal tact and hopefully put some flesh on this. You know, we can talk about working together, sharing power, reciprocity, collaboration, partnerships, etc. all the key words that often make up uh, co-production. But let me kind of like flesh it out for me. Uh, one thing I've come to really realise, both working with disabled people in terms of co-production, but also somebody for, uh, for several years had uh, mental health issues as well. So I was on the other side of it in terms of being on the co-production side, being co-produced uh, from that sense. For me, it's also a way of being, a way of being, uh, and there's a set of intentions behind it. And what do I mean by a way of being? I, I think there's a lot of people have good intentions, and I think a lot of people want to do co-production, but for certain reasons, whether it's their disciplinary perspective, whether it's uh, their parad paradigmatic perspective, whether it's just how they've operated in, in life. It's very challenging for them to move into the really good co-production space, giving up power, giving up sense of responsibility, working with people, not on people, not just giving tokenistic views, such as giving money to the participants, but actually having some reciprocity and giving your own time to the organizations, whether that's working with people to upskill the CVs, working voluntarily, as I do with Disability Rights UK, spent two hours volunteering uh, with them this morning as I do nearly every week uh, and that's the sense of reciprocity with that so for, for me it's this sense of way of being now and you're always checking yourself saying thinking am I doing this correct and always recognizing there is no really often correct correct way of of doing this because once you slip into the view that there's a formula I think that's when it becomes tokenistic so for me it's it's often when an organization that I work with or disabled people actually come and say to you afterwards uh, can we have a coffee because it's been a really good event can we go for a drink it's been a really good event thanks uh, and thanks for listening to me thanks for taking care of my thanks for not taking care, that's the wrong word. Thanks for respecting my lived experience. Thanks for valuing it. Thanks for taking my stories and honoring them. And thanks for sharing your own experiences as well and making yourself vulnerable in the process. Yeah. And that is a different way of being because as researchers, we often don't make ourselves vulnerable and particularly certain natural scientists. And so I think making that shift into you know, collaboration, sharing power, reciprocity, uh, and all those things what make up co-production it's easy to say on paper and that's why you read so many grants so many papers that are tokenistic those people want to do it I believe the intentions are there but actually doing it requires a really not just a mental shift but a shift in embodiment a way of feeling a way of being with people 
And I think um, we've we've spoken a lot about that intention, haven't we? Over uh, each kind of keep coming back. It's the um, it's the the value that's behind um, what you're trying to uh, um, uh, behind the behaviours, isn't it? It's what you're trying to ultimately achieve. I know Chrissy last week, you know, talked about not liking co-production or and having some as a term, um, and you know, having sort of the good or bad experiences and the contribution or the recognition of the contribution you bring of yourself as an individual to the to the conversation, as much as a a process to to try and follow, I guess. Um, uh, Dan Liz, do you want to have any thoughts on that? Yeah, go on, go on Liz, go for it. <laughs> um, well, I suppose it just really touched home what you said in relation to what Chrissy repeated a few times last time, which was being listened to. And that's something, you know, it was just quite simple for her. It's just like, I wasn't listened to when I felt that things weren't co-produced in a, in a useful way. And I was listened to. And, you know, and it's very obvious and we know, I mean, I know we've got to research things, we've got to have evidence and policy, I know all that, but instinctively, and we know as people, don't we, when we are listened to and when we're not, and, uh, and we feel it, and as we feel it, our service users feel it, people, we are, we are people just as disabled people are people, we're people together, we know when be we're being listened to or not, and that's really obvious. And, um, and another thing I, that, that um, you made me think about was, my own sort of personal experience of um, facilitating both good and bad co-production sessions um, and my own learning throughout the years. And um, I remember doing um, a co-production um, training session um, last year. And as part of it, I remembered that um, I went through my own uh, it was a, a kind of experience that I went through. And in order to kind of feel that I could embrace this co-production world well, I had to accept that I might be sitting in front of a service user that might look me in the eye and say, what you do in services isn't good enough and it's not good enough for me and you're not doing a good job. And I had to, I had to get to that point where I was okay and of hearing that. And, um, and until I got to that point, I felt that that was a turning point for me in, in understanding this world. And, um, and actually I think it's a really hard personal, um, um, I think it's a really hard experience to go through as a professional and, um, and I, yeah. And that for me is a really good example of a way of being. You've, you've transitioned into that and yeah. it, becomes, it becomes that experience now. Yeah. It, it's, it's made me think back, uh, Brett, that was really, really interesting and got me completely back into a moment uh, uh, of, of a program that we we worked on which was looking at supporting frontline clinicians uh, to use reflective practice uh, and no more so relevant than at the moment with the incredible pressures that people are under but there was a session a little bit like um, uh, this was just saying there was a session where we were trying to bring in this idea of reflecting and so we asked people to kind of come to the session and there was uh, uh, people who were there by virtue of being patients there's people being there by virtue of being staff in this kind of group and they've not really we've not really met before so this was the first time we we're up in Newcastle uh, uh, so well out of our kind of usual South Yorkshire stomping grounds um, and I remember we kind of we'd ask people to kind of come with a uh, with a with a scenario that they had that had happened to them that they'd Kind of subsequently, and I shared a story from my uh, when I worked clinically about something that didn't go well, and there was something about, and 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 I, and I forgot as I was saying it how it had affected me, and there was obviously something in that authentic moment that allowed everybody else to share their stories, um, and so it was everybody was in tears, but it meant that that group had really developed trust incredibly quickly, and actually, what was even more impressive was that, um, and this, isn't, this was happenstance rather than anything else, but one of the people who'd been there uh, by virtue of being a patient public involvement person for the trust said, oh, I'd, uh, I'm not going to try and do a jolly accent. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, just for everybody's sake. <laughs> no, we record it, that one. Sorry. sorry. Um, he said, I hadn't realised that you lot were people too. To the staff. <laughs> 
because and I think that's about yeah. Yeah. how patient and public involvement sometimes plays out in organizations. Is this, is this adversarial us and them? Mm. Mm. And, and so I think it's really this that that you, the, the words you said are the moment of, of vulnerability and that reflective nature of ourselves as practitioners, I think is is the chance to really create those conditions for that meaningful uh, engagement to happen. Yeah, and I think for me it flattens the power as well it, in that process. But as well, I think what you've articulated is a really useful I'm interested in narrative theory, and that's a key part of dialogical ethics. It's about sharing a story, it's about witnessing another person's story, listening intently, uh, living and breathing with it rather than just thinking about it in terms of analytical terms, letting it touch you, letting it move you. But then also being uh, as part of the witnessing and the dialogical ethics of being vulnerable and saying, yeah, here's a, here's a story that might resonate, that might challenge you, that might go over you, however it may be, but I'm sharing it. And in that moment, there's that sense of reciprocity that the dialogical, uh, the dialogical exchange begins rather than it become just a story that is given. Mm -hmm. And you become, in some respects, a taker of stories. Mm. Uh, and um, Brett, I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind kind of talking us um, through a couple of experiences where those those stories and those those narratives meet kind of you know policy agendas and evidence base and you know and and how we might particularly in a physical activity context how those rub up against one another because uh, you know um, we've chatted before about some of your experiences in this I, i'd like to just uh, invite you to talk about aspects of that if you wouldn't mind yeah, I mean, I can I can talk about like a journey through public health England and to a, a sense of uh, ableism and sedentary behaviour messages. I think that's a nice. Um, many years ago, um, we were uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Charlie Foster, Professor Dr. Uh, Charlie Foster. We were interested in disability and physical activity guidelines, and public health England uh, approached us to think about how we might develop some guidelines. Of course, they were evidence based, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but as part of that, we were interested about how we might communicate those guidelines. And when people are asking us, you've got to do X, Y, or Z, I kept coming back to them and saying, well, we're not the experts here. We're not the experts in communication. Uh, we need to listen to the people with lived experience about what do they prefer, who, who are the preferred messengers. We just can't assume it's a GP, et cetera. We can't make those assumptions. We've got to listen to people. And it, it took me, it took me, Quite a few telephone calls, should we say, and quite a few meetings with uh, various people from Public Health England. And there were several people that were uh, generous with their time and in terms of listening. Mm -hmm. But one thing that kept coming back in terms of the policy was we really don't want uh, to have disabled people involved because they're going to be too emotional. They're going to be biased. They're going to uh, bias the evidence and, you know, they're also politicised. So we're really not keen on having them involved. That was kind of like a turning point for me because I remember it vividly where I used to live. And I remember stepping around the, the house in a sense of angst. Do I take the grant and take this path or do I actually stand up for myself and do I stand up with, with the community? And that's partly co-production. So I remember calling Disability Rights UK and I said, we have two options here. And I knew the answer anyway. And they just turned around and said, well, there is only one response. We either do it our way in terms of the co-production, in terms of developing a, uh, a resource, or we just withdraw. And so I passed that message on uh, to uh, Public Health England, but thankfully somebody there listened, uh, Mike Brannan, and Mike said, well, let's go with this, see how it turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he gave us some space to do this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we got all the evidence and then we turned around, we worked with, uh, including about nearly 600 people in total, uh, disabled people. Uh, that stage, it was about 350 in multiple settings. We called them knowledge cafes around around the UK, and we literally was asking questions: How would you want this communicated? Uh, and then we ended up with, for example, infographic, other means as well, which I'll come back to in terms of arts-based research. Um, but what was interesting about this, and coming back to the policy and the physical activity, and I'll give this two examples: one positive. From there, from the dis disabled people, and one negative from me. The, the positive one, uh, two set lines to this. One was uh, when we was talking about sedentary behaviour messages. Uh, the traditional one, of course, many years ago was stand up, sit, sit less, etc. Uh, and 
I knew in my heart that wasn't necessarily appropriate for all disabled people, but it was incredibly powerful to hear people saying, no, this is ableist, ableist meaning that there's the assumption that we all have this normative body, we're all able to stand, et cetera. And you've got people with sitting disabilities, spinal cord injury, et cetera, et cetera. So no, 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 this, this is just a terrible public health message. We do not want this. And so we designed uh, together uh, a message that we thought was more straightforward that fits uh, with disabled uh, disabled people's lived experiences and what they wanted and that was just move more uh, and it was just a straightforward and the, the and the, the positive view of that was uh, public health island maybe last year they sent a set of tweets about you know stand up sit, sit less their public health and uh, again, I think this is part of the core production. I saw those tweets and I had two options. I could either sit back and not engage with them or step up there and say gently, you know, I think there's a few problems with this. Have you considered the ableist assumptions? And to be fair to Public Health Island, they said, no, we've not considered this. They came back, we had a brief discussion and then overnight it was changed. Uh, and I thought that would give very forward thinking ideas, but those didn't come from me. Those came from the co-production processes co-production yeah. processes and the other side of it uh, for me theoretically the issue of independence independence was a, a big outcome in terms of physical activity gives disabled people independence but theoretically for me independence is hugely problematic hugely problematic and I've theorized it in terms of the problems and etc but when I got around the table with disabled people and said you know do you independence is an outcome do you want it on the infographic etc they were saying yeah we definitely want it on the infographic uh, whereabouts and it was close to the center and I was like oh I don't really want it there it's problematic it's problematic and they said not for us it's not not for us it's not you as an academic it is but so I again that was me having to listen and to really give up my academic theoretical preferences and to be able to work with them to enable independence to be uh, mm. to be at the heart of uh, the infographic and then of course where does that infographic go, who disseminates it, etc. cetera. Um, but like all good production, co-production, um, one thing that emerged from this was I kept asking people who, who should be the messengers of physical activity. These were in passing conversations often. Who should be the messengers of it? Expecting the usual tried and trusted people, GPs, nurses, physiotherapists. But I kept hearing one group that I'd never considered. And I think this is one of the benefits of co-production as well. And that was social care workers. And they kept coming back and saying, social care workers. And I got curious and I kept coming back, well, why? Well, we have to spend a lot of time with them, either through getting our personal budgets, there are means uh, for getting personal budgets, for health and well-being, physical activity, the route for health and well-being, etc. And that really piqued me interest of thinking, okay, maybe social care workers could be an important group of messengers mm -hmm. uh, in terms of communicating physical activity and so for the last two years we've been working with uh, Disability Rights UK, Sport England and Social Work England to try and co-create, uh, co-produce a project around how we can do this and we had some failures along the way and now we're in a space where we uh, we're just going for funding for uh, to educate the social workers of uh, today and tomorrow i.e working with them in universities, teaching them about physical activity, disability rights, etc., but also CPD training for social workers in the forefront. That would have not come, not come whatsoever if we hadn't engaged in that co-production process. And if, uh, if I think more importantly, if uh, Public Health England at that time had got their way, none of this would have emerged. So I also think in terms of not just shifting policy in terms of sedentary behavior messages, uh, putting disability at the foreground. It also, I'd like to think, had a, a small change in terms of how you know, policy, Public Health England wanted to look at research rather than just evidence-based, evidence meaning RCTs, not evidence in terms of experiential knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Experiential knowledge is key to co-production. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. And what I, what I um, enjoy about those, uh, experiences <laughs> it's the ripple effect so it, it not not only d does it open up opportunities to think oh what about social work but it completely shifts what then becomes possible after that so it's the kind of the point of reference moves and then opens up a whole range of other ideas and boundaries that are no longer there it doesn't it's not just one stage removed it completely shifts then what's what's uh what, what's possible um yeah. 
And I think it also raises a lot of questions about research then, because if some people say, you know, what research will be doing in five years time, half the time, I, I don't really know, because it's, I'll, I'll tell you once I've spoken to a few hundred disabled people. <laughs> so that, you know, the research, traditional research priority, which shifts and changes over time. Mm -hmm. so, do you think that is a, a more common response from policymakers now, or do you think it's fairly unique to Public Health England? I don't know, Rob, have you, what's your... Um, I think, I think there is a, I said, I said this be, um, previously in a, a couple when we were chatting with Ollie about, um, about Sport England and their sort of openness to, um, to this. And I think it, the, the, the challenge is always the individuals versus the organization and the structures, isn't it? And, um, bringing with you, you know, big oil tankers, um, organizations of that size and nature you know is often challenging and um but i've been encouraged by uh, lots of the things that i've heard from from sport england uh, about how they would like to work i think they can go further but then you know can't can't we all um so um i, I do think it's i do think it's moving certainly um the recognition that we've um we've tried to um influence and, uh, and, and move people's behavior through very traditional evidence driven methods. And, you know, we're no more active as a result, things aren't moving. And so what about actually asking the people that we are trying to uh, support first and maybe starting there? And uh, it's very difficult to argue with that logic. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to argue when you say, well, do we really understand what it's like for someone living in, uh, that street in, in, in Darnall, which is, you know, two miles away from the AWRC. You know, I had some fantastic conversations really early on when I went, I went to the um, uh, Darnall Wellbeing, which is uh, an anchor institution uh, in, in Sheffield that supports the, the community. And uh, I went to their AGM and sat and listened to their stories and, uh, and narratives and just uh, as much as listened, felt what it was like to be part of that community. And I think that's really important as well. You get that um, that sort of um, tangible sense of what it's like as much as the, the words that come through and um, the things that they were saying about you know on paper you draw a circle round round all and the AWRC and the Olympic Legacy Park where we are is slap bang in the middle of it and yet it's not you know mm. it's not a place where they have any social power it's not a place that they perceive as theirs it's not a place that they even think about influence that you know there are hooks into it like the uh, the kids pick up and the collection of the kids but they only maybe go on the workshop road entrance which is at the top of the olympic legacy park and the AWC is at the bottom which is down leeds road slightly different and it you know it might as well be and you know it might as well be in durham or newcastle because it's not part of their community and uh and so you know the conversations we've started to have is well um how might we start to think about what we could do for you and how, how you could use our assets to achieve so, what you want to achieve. So is this another challenge for this idea of kind of national policies? Because is it not about local derived stuff? Because uh, we, we talk about um, uh, uh, people as if they're some sort of homogenous group. Um, and, and I wonder if, uh, if that's a big challenge and that's a big challenge for their research paradigm. And that's where we come directly into conflict with the kind of RCT that you can somehow remove context from evidence and it will be magic and shiny um, and tell you the truth about something. Whereas actually, we know that even in drug trials, that's not necessarily the case. But here where you're trying to influence local behavior, and as you've said, local at a micro level, Rob, mm -hmm. from not, not even at postcode level, but depending on which road you approach from. Yeah. Is, is that a big challenge? Or is that an opportunity for co-production to move to that kind of neighbourhood level to, to understand what's needed locally? I don't know. What, are, what, what are people's thoughts? Liz? You know I mean? um, well, um, I was having some thoughts actually when you were um, talking, Brett, and, uh, and I was thinking, you know, what a great, what a great programme really. And the fact that you were, is it, was it your, position and your sort of power and influence that that allowed you allowed you the time and space to um actually 
work in a co-produced way in, in the way that you wanted to. And actually it was your connections within Public Health England that actually they were the, they were the ones that decided to trust you and allow you to, to convince them really. And it sounds like you, you did a good job in terms of convincing them. But where we are still in, it still feels to me that we're, we're still in that space and time where, whereby certain people get that time and freedom and ability to actually do things well, but it's still a bit hit and miss. And uh, it depends who you are and... I, th I think, I, I can't take any credit for this. It, it, I think going back to what Rob said, it was a group of individuals essentially just all came together at the right time. There was no formula behind it. It was just right, right place, right time. That was, you know, Charlie Foster having great influence in terms of uh, with Public Health England and physical activity guidelines, him being open, being uh, thoughtful, creative and wanting to make a difference. Uh, Mike Brannan from Public Health England wanting to listen and to move with things and from Sport England you know we've done a lot of work in terms of trying to work with them on co-production but that's from Disability Rights UK we've got a co-production program with them we've been trying to uh, we've engaged with them give, delivered workshops to Sport England and we've got a two-year program of uh, research with them on trying to deliver workshops around the UK to sports organisations so co-production's more in, in their thinking on that so I think for me it's a group of individuals that are willing to take a risk that are willing to change how they might operate because ultimately they're might be thinking yeah that's not working so how can we do something different rather than just chugging along on the same linear path and i think those are quite brave individuals and for me those are the forward thinking uh, individuals and but the, for me it's never been a formula uh, and i certainly had no no one in public health england had heard of brett smith and uh, the fact again that i was working with disability rights was hugely important but again that was down to one individual uh, leanne who i'd struck up a brilliant relationship with and reciprocity me giving a lot of time with them and leanne giving a lot of time and so there was that sense of trust for them and i felt their backing and their voice uh, behind it i, I mean I, I think one of the interesting things was and i just want to be really clear about this and just test test this the it's not about the evidence it's not about co-producing the evidence that physical activity has benefits i think the key thing here is it's about the co-production of how it's presented and the messaging yeah. and so for your to back to your point dan i think absolutely for me that that the co-production of the messaging and how it's positioned and how it lands and how it's shaped um has to be um with the the intended audience i mean you know, uh, I can't, I can't see how you would, it would be effective. And yet here we are, we look for, you know, the obesity campaign, for example. Um, and I don't, I don't really want to get into that, uh, on, on, on this, but, um, uh, you know, for me, it's about the messaging and how, how things are communicated where not, not, not all, but lots of the value of uh, uh, of co-production, and because you all, you always, it's about framing things in a language that uh, that resonates. You know, it's a conversation that makes sense to people, and um, what might make sense to me wouldn't make sense to someone in uh, in Dharma. I know that because I, I, I've listened to their their conversations. So, I think that's really really important. I mean, I I think I'm um, biased because I. For my interview, I spent a long time, a lot of time looking at Sport England sort of policies and stuff like that. But so I don't know if my opinion is particularly broad, but when I was looking at the policies, I just felt quite inspired. And um, because the kind of that kind of listening to people and co production seemed to run through everything. And, um, and you know, I've, I've, I've worked. Um, quite a bit with the Get Set To Go project, which again is, a, is funded by Sport England. And, um, and I know that they were interested in here around kind of co-production when I was doing my interview recently. And I just thought, you know, it seems to me that sport does seem to be, or has this sort of uh, chance to sort of lead the way in terms of um, doing co-production well and showing people actually how it's done and so that's that that's kind of my sort of outsider view kind of looking in and it and that draws me into sort of thinking about how we could um, 
embrace it further within health and, and sport uh, as well. I think it's a really exciting opportunity. And, um, and kind of going back to what you, you and Dan were discussing there around sort of Darnell and the Move More stuff, I think it's, um, I think the, the intentions are there and, 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 and Dar it's Darnell wellbeing, isn't it? And, um, and I think, you know, I've worked in the NHS for quite some time, but over the last sort of more, more sort of the last five years, I've done a lot more work with voluntary sector organisations who I think are just, just just a bit better at kind of um, listening to people. Yeah, it's easier. I don't know if it's easier for them to listen to people because they their whole unit or organisation has that direct contact with the people that are using their services, rather than say within the NHS where you know. And I mean, I know it's not like this really, but it it, it is a bit. You know, the directors are over here. And uh, and um, you know and the other workers are over here and it's all a bit um, you know uh, separate and actually do the directors actually talk to mm. you know have that personal connection mm. with uh, service users even if they want to the desire might be there but actually they don't probably. I, and, I, th so, mm. yeah. I think it comes back to the way of being. You know, you spend time with them and it's um, just the way of being and and I think. In terms of the Darnell example, you know, um, I think the reality is really that we're desperately trying to catch up with something that they've been doing for a long time. Um, um, and, you know, they kind of, um, Jack, uh, who had the vision for the Darnell wellbeing around the Peckham experiment, you know, and uh, this idea of placing wellbeing at the heart of communities and building things around people and what people need. And you know, it's it, it's embodied that in uh, in 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 the Donna Wellbeing Program, and um, Lucy and Gareth and the team, um, you know, are doing some fantastic work. And we're really trying to understand um, and learn from them about how we might be able to support the um, the physical activity uh, agenda. And it never starts with a conversation about physical activity. That's the first thing. <laughs> you know, there's other things that are way more important within communities, but actually activity might be able to support some of those social connections, social isolation, reduction in crime, um, improvement in uh, quality of air, you know, these sorts of things, but it never really starts with a conversation. Well, uh, normally starts with a conversation about a bike if you get me involved, but um, uh, you never, it, that's never the thing that really is what it's about. It's, there's, there's more fundamentals to that really. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, uh, I, I was just, I was just wondering, so some of what you're talking about is, is again, it's, uh, so this, perhaps the disconnect is, is about how different, I think uh, Brett's already spoken to this, uh, around how different parts of this picture value knowledge. So, so there is a disconnect that the, the knowledge produced through kind of research has somehow uh, is going to be the right thing to to do that and that that knowledge generation is is the key component of of this academic endeavor but actually it, it has to be around and i'm just going to quote back to what you've just been telling me so the framing of knowledge for local consumption this idea that how you can kind of transform and let communities make sense of that knowledge themselves to work out how they could best apply it in their own areas and I think that's where some of the really interesting stuff around kind of co-production in that knowledge mobilization sense comes through really clearly. Mm -hmm. um, that's nicely put, Dan, yeah. And I, I think that that is, and it's, it, it reminds me a lot of, uh, you know, I'll use narrative theory, but then just embed it in, in practice. You know, stories travel, uh, but stories are often very locally driven and culturally driven. And when we move into the traditional research world of RCTs and so forth, we assume that stories can be given from the top down and people absorb them or a number can be absorbed. But that's not how it is in, in everyday practice. We resist stories, we change them, we edit them, we feel them in our bones, we go with them, we grow up, in, we grow up with certain stories in our local community. And those stories resonate with us, those have become meaningful for us. And I think what was said earlier about uh, more locally driven work, I, I think that for me is next 
the next wave, so to speak, not COVID, of course, but the next, <laughs> not, uh, not uh, the next space that we need to go. And I think as part of this, I want to see, and I'm going to throw this out because I've been thinking of this about a lot, few, few months now, is rather than scaling up, resisting scaling up and actually start working much more in small groups. And I can just give you an example. This morning I was with Disability Rights UK and we was talking about three organizations, uh, Disability North, uh, Dance Syndrome, and I, I escaped from an organization in London that they work with uh, Asian disabled people. All of them were doing radically different things, all really locally based, uh, totally different. You couldn't supplant one in another place, etc. Totally, totally different. But all of them were run by three or four, 10 people, uh, not masses, not millions of people are going to reach, but hopefully a few hundred, hopefully a few thousand, etc. Really innovative ways of making use of small amounts of money to do physical activity. So one was Bollywood dancing uh, outside under a marquee, need money for a marquee, need money for, uh, for a, a dance, uh, some dance equipment, some weights, etc really really innovative uh so 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 small in so many respects but yet potentially so impactful so impactful yeah yeah i, I remember doing right at the at the early stages and we've got um uh ros uh davies uh from um uh, sheffield coming on uh the next week i think or, or um and um uh, right in the early days of the move more program we talked about uh and we delivered a program called small sparks and uh, this idea of seed corn funding, and the st you know, there's, there was the kind of the um, similar stories to you about providing the infrastructure and stuff. But the one that stuck with me the most was um, funding to get some keys cut to uh, you know a local uh, community centre to be able to provide access. And you know, it, it's just um, it's the simplest things that that actually release the the um, communities to, to do things for themselves and um, you, you don't need to convince them you don't need to kind of you know create a really strong narrative right just you know open up the uh, the access to be able to deliver stuff and yet we would have complicated that with a uh, a massive application process and if you could just fill out this uh, you know this form and do you know and we resisted a bit of that and um, uh, it's really important that we think about uh, providing up those sorts of opportunities. And I think one of the things that, um, it's an infrastructure question really, is how we can generate the opportunities to provide that funding and that resource in, in ways that isn't really bureaucratic, that works for, for large organizations and institutions like universities or um, bodies such as that. And actually means that we can facilitate the, the resource to get to the right places really, really quickly. Um, and some of that infrastructure, and I, I wonder about some, um, conversations with people like Sport England and, and Public Health England about the co-production of how funding reaches these places. Not just about co-production around the interventions themselves and, or how, the, how they should be communicated, but about the funding sort of stuff and how we can get past that really. Yeah, and I, I think you're right as well. I mean, to be fair to Public uh, uh, Sport England, they've given Disability Rights UK and various others to disseminate this to local people uh, and local groups. And they've recognised that organisations like Disability Rights have the local connections to be able to make uh, the right judgments. And the other part of it is you're correct, because a lot of these forms that we see uh, for the communities that I work with uh, are ableist and disabledist and by that I mean they mean you've got assumption of certain literary uh, uh, capacity and uh, you're able to think in certain ways when disabled people are, might not be able to have do it in the way that you think a form should be done and they can actually do it in much more creative ways if you give them the space to be able to do that yeah. uh, so I, I think we've got to be more flexible more open and work with people on their on their own terms to understand their lived experiences and what they might bring to the table to share yeah. Yeah, the no. process yeah Liz you were going to come in I just had a really good idea I mean we are complimenting good well we're recording yeah. it so yeah. come on this is the time really good um, we're complimenting Sport England non-stop. I just, I think they should give us some money and we can, we can do something really wonderful. We've already uh, given you a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we should work, we can, we can work in partnership with Dawn and Wellbeing, you know, but I, I suppose I just wanted to emphasise that point that you just made, Brett, about um, scaling up 
rather than thinking that way um you know thinking about actually listening to people and um and it makes so much sense that and it's on the one hand you know it's just so obvious but actually even I for this kind of new job thinking about kind of how to how can we take this model in Essex and they've got this brilliant model how can we scale it up and spread it across the country and uh, and that's absolutely the wrong way to think isn't it it's about kind of thinking about what what is what is the evidence and what works really well and I think not forgetting that because sometimes I think I mean I know you guys wouldn't but um but you know I think sometimes when I've worked with um with service users with people it's kind of this assumption that actually okay so it's all bottom up then and um and so that doesn't really sort of sit well with me that it's all bottom up and actually it's all from people and actually no it's about all coming together and listening to the evidence and take taking the evidence mm -hmm. and, and help using that evidence to form part of the discussion of co-production is that is that how you you see it and is that how kind of co-production work has happened with you what because there is evidence out there and we you know we want to listen to that don't we but is it is it is it a part of the process rather than the guiding force yeah, uh, yes, for me. I'll give you an example. I think I'll flesh it out with a story. Uh, in terms, and we, we've got evidence of what works in physical activity, what doesn't work, barriers, facilitators, etc., for disabled people. Uh, and we were asking the question uh, with Disability Rights uh, UK: How do we communicate this? How do we get it across to disabled people? Uh, so we was asking them how might we do this? And various formats came up, not just an infographic, uh, but one was uh, stories creative non-fictions and creative non-fictions the key word another one was animation we designed uh, comics etc uh, but i think the creative non-fictions speaks to this and in that we worked with a disabled writer very experienced writer owen and i worked with him i provided the evidence in terms of the content the factual content these are the barriers that we know from the evidence this is how much physical activity disabled people do, need to do for health benefits etc but he wove that using literary techniques into a story not an account not a scientific paper but into a story in terms of these three characters sat around a table in a cafe talking about barriers facilitators physical activity how peer support is so beneficial how fun physical activity can be when you don't talk about physical activity but you just with other people and hanging out and doing things and physical activity fades into the background mm -hmm. and that was all evidence-based so you as researchers could go into that story and say yeah that makes sense there's there's the evidence from that paper there's that evidence from that paper and what we were able to do is weave together a lot of research a lot of evidence into this story and it was a matter of Owen and I coming backwards and forwards of saying yeah this story's great but you're veering off the evidence could you come back and make sure that you keep stick to this stick to this evidence that evidence was not only RCT quasar qualitative but also lived experience as well mm -hmm. it's, go on sorry no, no, go on Dan yeah recurrent theme so yeah I mean so Ollie's PhD resulted in kind of some comics uh, type stuff that came out we've used animations with young people with mental health to talk about what they'd like to see in services going forward and that was based on the lived experience but also on an understanding of service provision uh, because they worked alongside the people who delivered that service and i think it comes back to this time old thing when we talk about knowledge mobilization where all the money goes into the research and no money goes into mobilizing it at the end because that doesn't write papers in the same way as an RCT does and I think there is that kind of mismatch uh, between how that time and money is, is is spent the scaling up thing Liz that was a beautiful eloquent uh, description of why it's wrong uh, in the first place but there is something about you can scale up the ideas but the local implementation is the thing but we, we tend to find and and I don't know I guess human beings try to find the things that appear to work locally without understanding why they work locally so you get a successful service and think i can will sustain will spread that and it's not it's because of somebody like the darnell group who've been involved or somebody like brett's enthusiasm or rob's uh, nabs about how to do stuff in that particular area that's made the difference and if you just transplant it without 
those kind of things happening, yeah. it won't spread. No, no, no. It's the active ingredients. It's yeah. the, you know, and, and I, I, <laughs> it used to be called if you could only just bottle that. Yeah. But, you know, and, and yet, you, you know, you can, you can explore it. But um, I think one of my frustrations is that we still um, give preference to outcome driven research. And actually, without really deeply understanding um, so the processes and mechanisms through which we think this um, is working. And uh, when you understand those mechanisms um, and you can start to consider the context, that, then I think you've got a much better um, opportunity of being able to um, apply those mechanisms within different contexts. And I think it's the application of the mechanisms and the way that things work um, intuitively, tacitly through evidence that give us the opportunity to have an impact much more broadly. And I think that's actually what people mean when we talk about scaling up. It's having that, the, the, the impact that we've seen here, how could we get some of that much more broadly? And for me, it starts with, well, explain to me how this is working. What are the active ingredients here that you've identified? Um, and then let's start to look for those active ingredients rather than a, a blue thing with four wheels that looks like a car and everything else. Well, it actually might be something else. And so um, we get fascinated by the thing because, you know, it's, it's perceived to be efficient and easy. And, and, and actually, we know that it's messy and complex and takes time and effort to, to translate these different programs. And um, I think sometimes we look to try and have the impact much, much quicker than the reality is it's taken 20 years or so to get to this point of a really effective intervention because there's been trust and there's there been consistency of purpose and people and process and, and, uh, and we want to see that much more quickly, don't we, sometimes? Um, do you mind if I just um, ask a question? I suppose just... Um, Brett, it would be, I mean, the others can answer as well, if you like, but um, <laughs> I, I wondered um, what you thought in terms of um, the future and, um, and you know, I think we're, at the moment we're all, we're, we're all talking together as kind of, I think, people that are already kind of, um, we've already been sold the idea of co-production and we're all into it. Uh, are we, is the future... Is the future bright, Brett? <laughs> and and, um, and are we going in the right direction, do you think? Are you hopeful? Anybody that knows me will know that I'm often hopeful. I've, I've had to be. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have uh, fallen off the wagon a long time ago, the academic wagon. I, 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 I am. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. And the reason why I'm hopeful, because there's the people that I at least privileged to work with, the good people, and they believe in co-production and their heart's in the right place. Uh, and equally, I must say, they're not bothered sometimes if it's not co-produced. I think we should bring that to the agenda. It, it doesn't matter if it's co-designed uh, or whatever it may be, another co, uh, or even not any of the co's, because that still serves a value. Uh, so I think for me, the future is several things. It's also calling out people that are t talking about doing co-production when they're not doing co-production, and particularly when they get the grants, uh, and then they go off and spend all these masses of money and nothing really comes from it, and people are frustrated who are part of the co-production process. I think people must be held more accountable to this, uh, certainly. I think universities need to change, and the systems that we're in need to be much more flexible and fluid and accept messiness uh, as part of this. Now, that, I, I don't see that happening overnight, but uh, at least at Durham, I, I, it's a much more vibrant culture than I've experienced in, in other institutions in terms of enabling that. So I'm, at least where I work, I'm quite uh, thoughtful, uh, hopeful about that. And I think in, in the future, if we, can, if we can start documenting much better, demonstrating it, uh, whether that is explanations at the local level about how we can, I don't want to say measure impact, I don't want to focus upon that, but document it maybe. Uh, through co-production and the reason why I say document is because we often fall into the trap of measurement uh, in the future and it could be for example visual uh, visual pictures it could be whatever it may be but I want uh, impact co-produced as well what 
what might co impact mean to you uh, over a period of time. So yeah, I, I'm I'm hopeful, and I'm hopeful because I think we're as human beings we're we're reasonably imaginative. We can be self-destructive sometimes, and we can be a little bit nasty to each other sometimes. But I'm I'm hopeful that really we all want to work together to do something. And I like appreciative inquiry about that, in that, you know, we might have conflicts, we might have complaints, but ultimately we, you know, the people I work with, we all want to support disabled people to, to be able to do and have independent lives as they may say, uh, et cetera, uh, healthy lives, uh, opportunities for employment, physical activity, uh, and so on. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but we need, we need a lot of change. We need a lot of good people calling people out we need a lot of good people showing demonstrating what's good research uh, and i think as as part of that we need more collectivity not universities being isolated uh, we need I, one thing I've, i'm so respectful of rob and everybody else is bringing different people together that doesn't happen too often mm. and I, I think we need to do more of that it's the word competition should not be part of our vocabulary we yeah. should harness co-production, working together mm -hmm. to do things better. And that requires a shift, of course, of systems, how we, people get promoted, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I, we have to be. That's great. I, I feel hopeful that you're hopeful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I, you know, I really, um, really enjoyed this session, as I have the others. But I actually do feel quite a sense of hope and um and um it, i just feel quite inspired <laughs> not quite sure why but I do. <laughs> don't get me wrong <laughs> that is my doorbell which my kids can you hear it my kids changed the tune so that's the one for today I'm, 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 hoping, I'm hoping that doorbell will uh, be the end of this session if you can cut and paste it and splice it towards the end. Well, so them on. Dan, Dan's, in, Dan's in charge of the editing, so um, <laughs> yeah. if we could just... Uh, if we could I, I should add that whilst hopeful, you know, funding needs to change, and I know probably Ollie has talked about that, etc. And whilst hopeful, you know, it, it won't be easy. A lot of people have to do a lot of work and a lot of people doing hard work to do this mm. that's emotionally draining yeah. uh, and there'll be you know, some people dropping out as a result i, I would suspect but it's supporting yeah. them but it is yeah. hard work yeah. you can't yeah. deny that at, at risk at risk of kind of sending us off into a, a tailspin here I'm, I'm gonna i asked a question um right at the very first sort of um conversation about these about the um uh I guess the, in the traditional sense, the um, evidence of effectiveness is co-production. You know, do you think, do you think in order for us, uh, or for order for this to get to the stage where it becomes far more prevalent, that we are gonna need to do a study that looks at the effectiveness of co-production, you know, over a period of with follow-up versus a non-co-produced study? What, you know, do we need, it's, it's, it sounds it's ironic, but like, do we need to, Consider that. Yeah. So that, well, <laughs> uh, oh, go okay, good. Uh, well, it's been great. <laughs> <laughs> go for it, Dan. Uh, no, no, I was just going to. Uh, so this, it might kind of be a, a bit of one, but uh, the the fire study, which was Brendan McCormack and Joy Rycroft Malone, was looking at different interventions in care homes. But one of the interventions was using kind of co-production, creative person-centered care as, as, as a driver for improvement over traditional models of improvement. So, and, and the problem was that you get your implementation scientists involved and they say, well, there is no fidelity because everybody did it differently locally. <laughs> and, and, and actually you go, yeah, that's the, that's the right way to do it. <laughs> and they go, but that means we can't compare it. Uh, so there are some fundamental challenges around doing what you're describing. I wonder if Brett's earlier clarion call to document uh, what we do and what happens is, is one way to, to look at this and bring together more of a, a case book. I think that the, I think that the PHE, uh, Public Health England uh, uh, example that Brett used demonstrates the power of this approach in terms of identifying different ways of reaching people, identifying uh, different messages that are far more inclusive 
that, is that the sort of impact we want to be kind of trying to demonstrate rather than uh yeah somebody's hba1c was uh, half a point lower because they were in a co-produced diabetes session. Maybe this is a question for Ros next week. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I have some very modest thoughts on it. I think number one, I think the issue of how we look at research and science uh, limits how we can think about impact and that needs to change as, as you've as you said and that, that comes back down to that way of being. Uh, different people need to operate differently or let us do it on our own terms uh, on that. I think secondly, the idea of what it might mean needs to be co-produced because impact can mean different things to different people and it can be really small in terms of the measuring of it, but actually for groups of individuals, it could be so huge in terms of their lives. And secondly, thirdly, you don't know where it spreads and the impact it might have on their home life when we're not measuring it, when they can have a conversation with their son or daughter or have a telephone conversation and it spreads. We, we don't, we don't analyze, I mean, we, we can analyze uh, that, uh, of course. Uh, so I think we need to do that. And I think lastly, of course, and not lastly, but one of the final points is that we, we're obsessed, uh, and I use that word on, pur on purpose sometimes with the word impact, because we are driven by institutional agendas, i.e. the ref uh, in this case. And that's neither a good thing or a bad thing per se, but when we come be driven by the ref per se, then we are limited to what we might demonstrate as impact because you know, there are certain ways of doing that and you can't capture other forms of impact. But for me, the whole point of co-production is that if I can go to bed at night and think, yeah, with the people that I've worked with, it's made a little bit of a difference. That's, that's, that's good enough for me. And I see that in their stories. I see that in their actions i see that in that what they do next and i see that in terms of what they impact upon me as well uh, we, we shouldn't uh, have uh, ignore that as well because it's reciprocal it's made a difference to me and how i operate and how i teach and how we're talking yeah, no, exactly. that can't be captured through x y or z yeah yeah no 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 i agree i agree um well i think we're we're uh, the uh, <laughs> I'm always hesitant to close these conversations down because I, I, I thoroughly enjoy them. But I think um, we, uh, we've got, well, I've got tea to contribute to and uh, there's, there's washing over here that's not going to sort itself out. So um, thanks, uh, Brett, for giving up your uh, time for coming on our uh, merry uh, band of conversations about co-production. It's been uh, incredibly valuable to hear you talk about your experiences, um, your courage and your commitment towards this uh, agenda. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's been fantastic to, to spend a bit of time with you and, uh, and Dan and Liz always for your, your contributions.